Benefits and pensions. What kind of social safety net should we have? And is it better to share a welfare system with the rest of the UK or to design one just for Scotland? Hello and welcome to the latest in our series of Newsnight debates ahead of next year's independence referendum. Tonight we are talking welfare. Benefits and pensions count for over a third of the UK's public spending. The UK government is undertaking major reforms to the system in part to cut costs. Have they got it right? And if not, what should the state provide for pensioners, job seekers and those with disabilities? And what state is best placed to provide for Scottish needs? The UK or an independent Scotland? These are just some of the questions we'll try and tackle tonight in conversation with Alex Johnson, MSP, who speaks on welfare for the Conservatives. The SNP's Jamie Hepburn, who's Deputy Convener of Holyrood's Welfare Reform Committee. Labour MSP Jackie Bailey, who's her party spokesperson on social justice, equalities and welfare. We're also joined by Eben Wilson of the campaign group Taxpayer Scotland, which is neutral on the question of independence but in favour of radical reform of the welfare system. And Robin McAlpine's here from the left-wing think tank, the Jimmy Reid Foundation. He's also part of the Commonweal Project and is personally in favour of independence. Well, welcome to all on our panel and in our studio audience. Let's go straight to our first question. It comes from Thomas Kerr. Thomas. Is it fair that someone who's on benefits can earn more than someone who's in full-time employment? Is that fair? Let's start with you, Eben Wilson. I don't think it is fair, but I don't use the word fair. Um, I think it's one of the things we have to think about in the welfare system. What do we want welfare to be? Do we want it to be a safety net for everybody, or is it a system of redistribution? Personally, I think most people want it to be a safety net. When it's a safety net, these problems where people are earning very large amounts of money, because maybe they've got lots of children, I don't think will appear. The interesting thing is, can we actually avoid turning it into a redistribution system, because our politicians will keep spending lots and lots of money on welfare to buy votes. Robin McAlpin. I think the question is the wrong way around. I think the question should be how can you work 40 hours a week in Scotland and be worse off in someone than benefits? This is a low pay problem. We have a poverty economy. Um, if you imagine that there's a kind of virtuous part, a virtuous wage that runs perhaps from 25,000 to 35,000 where people are paying taxes and they are, you know, they're buying, they're shopping, they can look after themselves, they're comfortable in their family. Only one in five people in work in Scotland today is in that category. Three out of five working Scots earn less than £25,000 a year, and half of the Scottish population in work earns under £21,000. The problem that we've got is not a problem with welfare. The problem that we've got is a tax base which has been decimated by a poverty economy. We have got to stop accepting a circumstance whereby employers can pay people for a full-time job and the only way that they can survive is through benefit top-ups. We have to take a fundamental rethink of the kind of economy that we are willing to have in this country and so whether we can accept an work as poverty. For a, a higher basic minimum wage set by, by government? We should absolutely have a living wage, but we also need economic reform we have far too much low pay industry. OK, I want to, to bring in some... I'd like to bring in some views from our audience and I'll start, first of all, with the, the questioner. What do you think in answer to your own question? Well, I think it's completely unfair that there's someone... I mean, I, I speak for personal as well, that there's someone who can earn a lot more money than someone that's been working full-time on benefits. Um, my grand and granddad have worked all their lives. And there's people that I know that's on benefits and they earn a lot more than what my grand's earning right now. And I think it's completely unfair. The UK government uh, has been phasing in a benefits cap to limit to around £500 a week for a couple, <coughs> the maximum amount of benefit that they can earn. Do you think they should go further? Yeah. Yeah. What would you I set honest, the cap at? I mean, I'm not a politician. I'm not here to speak for the UK government. I'm not ever going to be... Well, don't, that will be Prime Minister in time soon. So I'm not here to try you and never say know. this is... <laughs> well, I hope not anyway. But I'm okay. not here to try and say that this is what I think the cap should be at, but I think it should be a bit higher. OK, thank you very much. And uh, the gentleman here? Surely the problem is 
one that we should be looking at why are people not earning the money? Perhaps too much has been taken away out of their wage packet. We need to encourage people to work. We need to encourage young people to work. When they see that they're being taxed for all sorts of reasons, indirect taxation, be it petrol, be it the tax they pay, national health and insurance, and then they see the waste by governments of all political parties, then we need to change that system and make it rewarding to work. OK, and <laughs> gentlemen, two rows behind. Yeah. I think that's an excellent answer about the minimum wage. However, um, what happens when you raise the salaries so high and the, the wages so high that all the jobs disappear into Europe? We really have to stop um, thinking of this as a, a country problem and start addressing it as a global one because we live in a global society and the, the, um, the jobs in Scotland don't necessarily need to stay in Scotland. And as soon as you start to raise the salaries, then the employers go, and so do the jobs. OK, um, we'll bring that back to our, our panel and bring in our, our politicians uh, now. A reminder, Jackie Bailey, that the original question was, is it fair that someone on benefits can earn more than someone in full-time employment? What do you think? No, I don't think it is. And I think you know, society in general recognises that actually having a job is the main driver for us. Our ambition isn't simply to say, you know, we'll pay people more benefits. It's about making sure that if people have the opportunity to work, our economy grows. The welfare state has to be there as a safety net and it's appropriate that it is so. But our ambition should be much, much greater than simply saying we need to put more into the welfare system. It should be about generating employment, generating jobs. I've seen lots of people unemployed, disabled, who actually get a huge amount of dignity and respect from work. That's what we should be helping people to do. And I agree with Robin. We need to make sure that that work pays. Um, it was Labour, of course, that introduced the minimum wage. Um, it is Labour that's at the forefront of pushing a living wage because we shouldn't have a position where people are working and yet we are subsidising those employers by having to top up their income with state benefits. Jamie Hepburn. Well, let me first of all say, Thomas, I'm not here to speak for the UK government. I am, I'm unlikely to be Prime Minister anytime soon uh, as well. But uh, in terms of the uh, question you asked, I suppose it is uh, the way you look at it. Uh, Glenn mentioned the benefits cap. And actually what we know is a, a minuscule number of people in Scotland are actually going to be affected by the benefits cap. So this off-quoted uh, and off-cited idea that people are living up on benefits isn't actually uh, the reality. I think uh, the point has been made and it's been made fairly. Is, is, that, is that an argument for a, a tougher cap or for doing something else? No, I think it's uh, the point I was going to on to make, uh, Glenn, is I actually agree with the point that's been made. We have to make work pay more uh, than welfare. And in that regard, we see the Scottish Government instituting the living wage for uh, all those in its uh, employ. And, and the living wage is what? The living wage what? is uh, £7.40, if I've got that uh, 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 correctly. But uh, if you were earning £7.40, wouldn't it still be possible, at least in theory, to bring in more in benefits in certain circumstances? I think it would be theoretically possible. I think the point I'm trying to make, uh, Glenn, is because I think this goes into the rhetoric that's employed around this whole debate. Uh, people are trying to engender this idea that there are lots of people in Scotland uh, living up on uh, benefits, and that simply isn't the case. We know from the, uh, the uh, small number of people who have been hit by the benefits cap in Scotland that isn't the case. I'll tell you what I think is unfair. What I think is unfair that here in Scotland we have a government we didn't elect imposing these welfare reforms that are removing £4.5 billion in welfare payments in Scotland by the year 2014-15, going to remove £1.6 billion from the Scottish economy every year thereafter, imposing a bedroom tax that's going to affect 105,000 households in Scotland. Okay. And we see people, more and more people having to turn to food banks. That's what I think is unfair, Glenn. Okay. Um, I have to... I mean, I agree, these are issues that the Tories are bringing forward, but I'm slightly confused about Jamie's comments about the benefit cap because he's issued numerous press releases that I've read um, condemning the benefits cap, yet Alex Salmond recently mm -hmm. said that it was a good thing. So, you know, I'm confused as to what the current SNP policy is. Well, I'm, I'm glad to know that Jackie's reading my press release. I do. It's good okay, to know someone, Cla clarify uh, that, that concisely if you can. Well, I, I don't think there's the, the, the need to, uh, to see the benefits cap that's been imposed uh, here in Scotland because it in doesn't... In principle, it, are you in the SNP okay. in favour or against the, the benefits cap? I, I don't think there's any need to see the benefits cap. It's not actually uh, uh, you're required you're against here it. in Scotland. 
OK, thanks very much. Now, Alec Johnson is not here to speak for the UK government either, but it so happens he's a member of the Conservative Party, which leads that government. What's your view? You won't be surprised to hear, Glenn, that I agree with the questioner. I think it's appalling that people on about average salaries in Scotland are paying through the nose in taxation in order to support people that could actually get as much, if not more, from benefits. But I'm interested to hear some of the things that have been said along the panel, because the thing we need to achieve is a virtuous circle within the economy in order to make that unnecessary. And that means making some radical changes to the way the economy is run. It means growing the private sector, growing the wealth creating parts of the economy and shrinking the public sector as a proportion of the whole of the economy. And if we achieve that, then we'll have more people paying tax, fewer people drawing benefits, and then we can start to deliver the improved salaries and the improved conditions that can be achieved by doing that. So we what, you have moment, to lay off lots of public we, sector workers first? Uh, I, ideally, I would like to see the private sector draw workers out of the public sector. There are areas of the Scottish economy, such as the North East, where I come from, where that's happening already. It can happen across the rest of Scotland and it can deliver the kind of change necessary to increase basic salaries. OK, let's hear from our audience again. Uh, the lady in the second row. Yes. When you say draw out from the private se sector, is that based on what you're doing in the south of Scotland, uh, England, with no, privatising NHS hospitals? Let, let, let is that explain. where you're going to get the money well, for? Uh, to put into where, where I come from in the north east of Scotland, uh, we have local authorities and we have health boards who struggle to recruit because the private sector pays more than the public sector does. That's the kind of virtuous circle that will grow an economy, grow wages and ultimately okay, deliver jobs for everyone. You don't sound entirely convinced. No, because you're saying that would pull in to provide jobs, but what about uh, the patients from the, the NHS who won't be able to afford the private hospitals that you're going to... No, you, oh, okay. I'm I, not I, talking about I don't, about I don't want to turn this into a debate between you two, <laughs> but I think your point is, has been made. So the gentleman on the, the end here, yes. Yeah, uh, this discussion and these myths that are getting us told about uh, all these people living in wealthy off and benefit is just not true. I work in welfare rights. Uh, what this is is really is a sad indictment on the system we are in. We have people working poor that are going to food banks. Uh, we have unemployed folk that are, get, that are suffering the ben benefit tax. People that have got a spare bedroom they can't move out of that. That, that, that house because there is no smaller houses for them. So it's a, a direct take money off them, which previously they were told was just enough to keep them alive. Right. Uh, what, what I'm saying is uh, we also have workers that, that, that turn up for work in the morning and are told whether there's work for them or not, or not under zero hour contracts. So it's the working conditions, improve the working conditions, improve the, uh, the, the, uh, a living wage and then we, we can improve the economy. People, people don't uh, sit on benefit all, uh, and want to stay on benefit uh, permanently. You know, th th that's just another myth. OK, thank you very much indeed. I think we'll uh, leave that question at that point and move on to uh, a second contribution. Uh, our next question is from Elliot Thompson. Elliot, it's oh, yeah. on the, the front row here. <clears throat> yeah, I want to know what will happen to the pension age, because I'm a student at the moment, I'm not working, but when I do get a full-time job, will I need to work for the rest of my life? And that's a, a question for politicians whether welfare is organised across the UK or in the event of an independent Scotland. Let's put that one first of all uh, to you, Alex Johnson. Well, you're worried uh, as a young man. I'm 52 and I'm worried about where my pension's going to come from and when I'm going to get it. The key thing about pensions is to ensure that we have enough wealth within the economy to be able to pay for these pensions. Unfortunately, the state pension isn't like a private pension. It's not invested. The money has been used to provide support as it was paid in tax. And that means we have to ensure that the economy is strong enough with enough people working in it to pay the state pension in future. So it is absolutely essential that we maintain critical mass within our economy. That's why I worry about some hypothetical independent Scotland in the future. A, an economy that's dependent on a few key industries, one that could be undermined by changes in the oil price, one that could be undermined at any time by uh, fluctuations in the world economy and doesn't have the capacity to maintain pension payments. OK, now that's your, your fear in the event of independence, but the status quo is a UK-wide system and, you know, Elliot 
is still asking the question, is he going to have to work until his dying day? <laughs> I think we're all going to have to work a bit longer. I think the current system was designed in a circumstance where many people in work were able to pay for a few who had pensions. We now all live a lot longer. Uh, and in order to achieve the objective of having a worthwhile pension, which is a key commitment to the current Conservative government in Westminster, then we must expect to contribute a bit more. But we need more people working, we need more people contributing, so that ultimately there is the greater level of stability necessary to guarantee these pension payments. The state retirement age is to creep up. Is there a, a maximum, do you think, at which it shouldn't... Uh, go I, think, further? I think the current government commitment uh, is a, an appropriate age for it to take place. But, but if we find ourselves 20 or 30 years down the line, uh, we may have to reassess that in some future government in order to take into account the fact that we may even be living longer. Jamie Hepburn. Well, uh, Elliot, I know this is a, a question that uh, preoccupies a lot of uh, uh, folk, particularly of uh, certainly my generation as well. People are sitting there wondering if what's going to happen to uh, the pension age uh, in uh, the future. What I can uh, tell you is I think uh, we're well placed uh, here in Scotland to afford uh, pensions. If you actually look at the proportion of our GDP that's uh, spent on social protection, that is welfare and pensions, it's actually lower uh, here in Scotland than it is across the UK as a whole. We have a, a lower a dependency ratio than we do across the rest of the UK. And while we sit here in the city of Glasgow, there are many people in uh, Scotland who don't even live to see the current uh, retirement age don't get to collect their pension. I would question. But given the, given the, the entire, demographics, uh, the aging population across right the UK, including in Scotland, isn't this a challenge for any government, be it of an independent Scotland or not? Is that not why the Finance Secretary, John Swinney, in the Scottish Government commissioned work on the affordability, the future affordability of pensions? Well, I think it's certainly sensible to look at, at how we will afford pensions. I think you approach that from the premise that we want to deliver for people here in Scotland and I think the point I'm trying to make Glenn is that we are actually well placed to do so here in Scotland we can afford the uh, pensions base we have. I'm going to bring in some uh, thoughts from the audience and then come back to the, the, the panel. Gentleman in the in the middle, yes you. Yeah, well, firstly the IFS actually said Scotland has a problem with pensions. That's but the Institute for Fiscal yeah, Studies, yeah. an independent. But problem. just to pick up on the question, um, would an independent Scotland not be best placed to actually have a common pension scheme between the public and private sector? Because actually there's a two-tier pension scheme, and when you retire, it depends which you're in. OK, I'll uh, leave that as a thought. Thank you very much indeed. And the lady on the, the back row, yes. Um, as somebody who just recently received a letter saying that I've now to work until I'm 66, I just wonder how long we can flog people to the end, if you like, by having them out there working. I mean, I feel so disappointed. I've been out there working since I was 16, and for what? For things to keep shifting and shifting and shifting. And I haven't actually made provision to, to sort of like cover the gap between, say, 60 to 65, let alone 60 to 66. I mean, I think people have been asked an awful lot of. People have been out there and worked hard all their life and who really are getting pretty damn sick of it all. Thank you very much. Jackie Bailey. I've no doubt people are living longer and that does put pressure on our pension systems and what we need to be sure of is that they're sustainable. The way to do that, in my view, is to have a pension system that is across the UK because you then share the risks, you share the rewards and you pool resources and that's a fundamental principle that I think you know, applies here. Um, with pensions, it accounts for two-thirds of the Social Security budget. And because we are living longer, the numbers of people who will be eligible for pensions will increase. And we need to make sure, as I said earlier, that that, that is sustainable. I am astonished, though, to hear Jamie just simply assert that, don't worry, vote for independence, pensions will be affordable. When John Swinney, his own Cabinet Secretary for Finance, said, actually, do you know, we have a problem with the affordability of state pensions. We need to look at this. But isn't, and, that, you know, equally, isn't that equally a problem for... UK governments dealing with this issue. We haven't heard Absolutely. a lot about it for a while, but isn't sure. it likely that we'll have to pay more and work longer in any set of circumstances? I think everybody needs to make sure that pensions are sustainable. You can't, you know, for example, rely on oil to plug <coughs> the gap because of the price volatility. You can't say, well, we'll pay your pension this week, but sorry, next week the price of oil has dropped, you know? So, so actually doing this across the United Kingdom 
sharing the risks and actually sharing the re rewards is something that we firmly believe in. But, but, Jamie's but, solution really so, is to say to people, vote for independence, but we don't really know how the sums but, add no, up. Sorry, the, and you the cannot reality, do that with Sorry, pensions. Jackie, the reality is, and the figures demonstrate that some 14% of Scottish GDP is expended on uh, welfare and pensions, and it's 16% across the UK as a whole. So that suggests to me that it's more affordable in Scotland. I think Those are the figures. No. We're, not, not. we're not going to have to wait long to find out the answer it's to not. this, because the word is that in the next week or two, the white paper on independence will finally be published. So can Jamie give us a categorical promise tonight that that white paper will contain an explanation as to how the pension scheme will operate in an independent Scotland? Well, I think, as Alec well knows, uh, Glenn, I'm not writing the white paper, I'm not in government. But You've set up I, an expert group. There is an expert uh, working group that's working later. towards that, and it's going to report and it's going to feed into that process. Okay. So the expert working group doesn't report till 2016. That's a full two years after the independence the, vote. The, you know, you the cannot have group has already published its first report, uh, which Jackie. said okay. stay part of the UK I system. Think, uh, no, that's not quite what what No, it did not say that. <laughs> I think okay, these three are even. fiddling while Rome burns. It's very interesting that a young man asked this question because it's the young people who are paying for today's pensioners. That's what we've ended up with. I would like to see a system where we actually pay through our own lives for our own <coughs> old age. Not all of us will be able to do it. But I think the idea of a pay-as-you-go pension scheme after 60 years has been found impossible to achieve. We've run out of money. In fact, it's worse than that. We so have debts. Are you, you suggesting scrapping the state pension altogether? I think if it, we have to stop, give people a choice between they can go on a pay-as-you-go in some way and they can take the consequences or they can th be thrifty and look after themselves. But given we the, given the financial that turmoil that we've been through, how much trust do you think people have in many of the big institutions that we would be handing our money over to mm. other than government? They won't need to trust politicians. Yes, they might have to trust a pension fund. The pension funds are regulated very heavily now by the politicians, and some of their returns are bad because the way they're regulated and they have to hold bonds and not equities. And I know Robin will hate that idea. Okay, Robin, stuff. go for it. I mean, the history of pension funds and the mis-selling of pension funds to people in this country is a massive scandal. Giving over the entire control of decency and old age to financiers who are ripping us off strikes me as horrible. I'm 40 years old. I had kind of thought I might be able to retire in 25 years' time. And now it might be 26 or 27. And I'm being told even then that I might have to live in penury. So I'm going to pause for a second. I'm going to think, I'm not going to vote for that. Democratic consent does not appear to be part of this debate. I am sick of being told by accountants what constitutes decency in old age. We need old people. We need people who have worked their whole life to live in dignity. And whatever we've got to do as a society to make that possible is what we do. Yes, we've got to fix our economy. And there's all kinds of things we can do about demographics. We can encourage greater childbirth. We can encourage greater immigration if that's a problem. But let's start from the point that reaching the age of 65 is not you falling off normal life into a safety net. It's called getting older. It's I called being part of society. And that is just... crucial. That answer has just slashed the British and the Scottish economy into pieces. The single biggest source of investment in the British economy is the pension funds, and the single biggest earner in the Scottish economy is financial services. That would kill Scotland stone dead. OK, I'm going to hear more from our, our audience. Um, young gentleman in the, the front row, yes. Uh, uh, yeah, it's already been touched on this point a wee bit. Um, I mean, the pension affordability will be a challenge for Scotland and the UK, regardless of the constitutional arrangements. We know that. But we also know two other things for certainty. One, Scotland, an independent Scotland, that is, would face far more volatility on the tax side, because oil makes up a large proportion of its GDP than the UK. The second thing we know for certainty, because uh, the House of Lords Economic Affairs Committee showed this, the Institute for Fiscal Studies showed this, is that there would be greater pressures on the expenditure side. So. The SNP say, oh, you know, pensions, it will all be affordable, we, you know, we might be able to uh, lower the retirement age, whatever. You're asking Scots to make the biggest decision we've ever had to make in over 300 years. You're making all these nice promises, but you're providing very little detail. It's not good enough. OK, thank you very much. And uh, young guy towards the, the back there. Yeah. Um, I'm a young person as well, and when I um, look at the system as it stands now, I honestly do not believe the system, by the time I reach whatever the retirement age is going to be, probably in the 70s by the time I get to it, is going to be around the system it is in. If we do not at least partly privatise the system to at least invest in rather have this sort of 
Ponzi scheme we have now where you just put it in as soon as you get it out again, that is just never going to work. There's never going to be enough people working to pay for the people that are on the pension. OK, and let's go back to the, the original um, questioner, Elliot. Um, what do you think is going to happen, almost regardless of the, the constitutional question? Uh, I'm not too sure, to be honest. Just think something we need to wait and see. But are you you're concerned that you might have to work a lot longer than your parents and their parents? Oh, yeah, definitely. OK, thanks very much indeed. OK, let's um, move on to another question. Uh, this one comes from Jennifer Calder. Uh, Jennifer Calder. Um, does independence offer the opportunity to build a fairer welfare system? Does independence offer the opportunity to develop a fairer welfare system? Jackie Bailey. I don't think it does. I'm not saying that you know, we can't develop our own welfare system. I'm saying we shouldn't develop our own welfare system. We have operated on the basis of pooling resources across the United Kingdom, sharing risks and rewards, and that's something that I believe should continue. I mean, I'm, I'm always struck by you know, the SNP's plan for welfare come independence, and there is no plan. There is no plan for that. There's no plan for the economy. In fact, the only plan I've heard them mention is how they're going to make sure that they give big businesses tax breaks by reducing the corporation tax. Or indeed, you know, what was it you're going to give tourists a tax break when they land at, at some of our airports? Now, I cannot for a minute see how we're going to have the kind of Scandinavian-style welfare system that everybody talks about on a US-style system of low taxation. The two just don't square. So whilst I think we can do it if we want to do it, I actually don't think it makes sense to when we would be better as part of the United Kingdom. OK, we'll let Jamie come in in a minute, but um, Jackie Bailey, what is your idea of a, a fairer welfare system? I mean, what would the, the top couple of changes that you would want to make to create a fairer system sure. be? Sure, I think there are discussions ongoing about how we could ensure that the welfare state is, you know, areas of it devolved in Scotland where there is an impact on local policy. But, you know, I come to the, the, the position from saying that it needs to be based on need, not on nationality, not on geography, not on the constitution, but across the United Kingdom, actually dealing with people's needs. Because for me, it's about people, it's not about geography, and it's not about the constitution. But is there, is there something that you would do if you were in charge tomorrow, no. Either in Scotland or across the UK, sure. what would be the first thing you would do to well, make I would the system fair? I, I would deal with the bedroom tax, frankly, um, because I'm very clear that we should scrap the bedroom tax. I'm equally clear that the SNP government have the power... Is that now Labour Party policy power, both in Scotland the and the UK? Let, let, let me just say to you, have the power to do something about that now. They can stop evictions, they can put money in place to help housing associations and councils. We've heard the most appalling stories over the last week about people threatened with eviction. We cannot In some cases, by Labour that. local authorities. Well, I have to say, by SNP councils too. You only need to look at Clack Manninshire. It's not about scoring points about which local authority did it. It's about having a consistent position across Scotland so that we see off this appalling bedroom tax. They can do it now, they have the power to do it, but they absolutely refuse Where to do so. Where would you and your colleagues find the £50 million that your finance well, spokesperson says would sure. be committed to this where Labour in charge? Sure. I mean, we, we will help the SNP <laughs> find it, but can I offer well, well, the well, £10 million pounds for Brave? That's been spent. OK. Yeah, but that was something, that's about choices. That's what politics is about. Jamie can choose to spend it on a Disney movie. We choose to spend it on taking care of the people of Scotland. Okay, better, that's what I the Scottish Parliament a, was elected for. I better for. give him a say. Um, well, Jamie Hepburn. Well, it's very interesting to be sitting next to Jackie Bailey this evening. We're hearing a whole rewriting of the Labour no, Party's not. position on Absolutely welfare reform. We've not. seen no commitment from where power lies in the Labour Party in this, uh, in relation to welfare, there is absolutely no well, Jackie Bailey speaks for the Labour on welfare absolutely. in Jackie Scotland. Bailey speaks, just said Jackie she Bailey speaks the, for Labour the uh, in Scotland, and Jackie Bailey is currently engaged in a campaign to ensure that power over welfare remains at a UK level and not in Scotland. So I do not see how Jackie Bailey can sit here with any credibility and actually argue that the Labour Party are going to do anything different on welfare when we know that they haven't made any commitment to do so. I presume the question, the original question Jennifer asked is a rhetorical one. The question was, could we do something better in Scotland? When we see a government that we haven't elected taking forward this raft 
of pernicious welfare reform that's ha uh, harming the very poorest, the most vulnerable in our society, that's disproportionately affecting women and families with children. How could it be possibly anything other than we'd be able to do something better here okay, in Scotland? Okay, I want to explore that with you a wee bit further, but seeing as Jackie Bailey pursued her approach to the, the bedroom tax, why don't you work with them and others to put together this fund to try and mitigate the impact of the well, bedroom tax. You is know, that a good idea? I, I'm, I'm certainly willing to hear good ideas. Thus far, the idea seems to be we should go back and get money that's already been spent before the bedroom tax was actually implemented. Yeah. Uh, you, Jackie, I mean, frankly, it's a proposition, of an it's a proposition okay, let, let that's been advanced without any uh, uh, serious basis. Jackie no. cannot say where that money is going to come from. She refused to say, is it going to come from health? Is it going to come from education? Is it going to come from the raft of measures that the Scottish Government's already taken to mitigate against welfare reform, be it uh, instituting the council tax reduction scheme or okay. the Scottish welfare fund? Right. Frankly, Glenn, I don't think mitigation is good enough. We need to take power and control over welfare here in Scotland so we can deliver a better okay, system. And how would you make it fairer? Well, let me say right off the top, I mean, I think it's interesting, Jackie, saying that the Scottish Government's uh, proposed to do nothing. Well, if we get control over welfare, immediately we'll get rid of the bedroom tax. If we have power to get rid of the bedroom tax, it will be gone. We'll reinstitute a direct payment in terms of housing benefit, because I know that's uh, an issue of some concern to housing providers, uh, uh, with, where the UK Government has taken away direct payment of housing benefit. But with respect, I mean, these, these are important issues, but they're not the, they're, the big they're ticket questions They're hugely in, in important. Now, we have the expert uh, group on uh, welfare reform that's uh, sitting devising... So you're waiting for them to tell you what I'm, 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 to do? I, I think we uh, have an expert group that's drawn from civic society and uh, people with uh, a benefit of uh, their expertise, and I look forward to seeing what they propose. OK, thanks, thanks, thanks very I'm much indeed. Yes, go ahead. I, I think it's very interesting that you've got three politicians who are, as you say, talking about the little issue which is who's got this money, who's got that money, what are we going to do with this money? The most important thing we have is we, we are the contributors, we the taxpayers pay for this, pay for this nonsense and this argument that we should bring back some form of contribution system so that we have our own welfare accounts. You think this that would be fairer? That this would be a, a way to start a fairer system, that we all know what we've put in. And from that point on, we can start moving our accounts around and redistributing into those accounts for the people who need it, the needs-based approach. OK, I'll come back to, to Robin and to, to Alec Johnson in a minute, but let's hear from our audience. Uh, lady on the end here, yeah. Yeah, we all know welfare needs reforms. We know that. But it's targeting a lot of the wrong people, the sick, the disabled. Personally, I'm chronically ill. I'm deemed fit for work. Is an independent Scottish government going to do away with ATOS? Is it going to create jobs for the fit people, never mind the disabled people? What's your answer on that one? OK, um, perhaps that'll be woven into some of the future contributions. Gentlemen, right in the middle there, yes. Sorry, one, one in front. In front. The, uh, the politicians and the other members of the panel tonight have had scant regard with uh, the national debt. If you look at the state of Greece and Portugal and Spain, all these countries have been vastly affected <coughs> by the debt that they're in. They've had to put up their retirement age, they've had to cut their benefits, they've had to cut their pensions. This country needs to get real and address the national debt, because if you don't, the markets will do it for you and you will end up in the mess that some of these European countries are in. So what does that mean for our welfare system, regardless of how the country is, is organised. Well, until somebody gets a grip of total government spending and actually spends on the things that we actually need to spend it on, not a lot of the luxuries that we have been spending on and the frivolous uh, money that we constantly hear government uh, wasting money on. There was Such a, as? Well, there was a, a good article in a paper today suggesting that if more uh, use was made uh, of electronic means, we could save £70 billion across the UK. That would be money for welfare if uh, the government of the day so choose. Thank you very much indeed. Um, lady on the end here in the green. Yes, uh, my question is to Jackie Bailey. Why should we believe a word the Labour Party says when they weren't there, even there in Westminster to oppose when the bedroom tax came in? OK, thank you very much indeed. Let's come back to our panellists. If you don't mind, I'll let Robin McAlpine come in at this stage. If I can come back to the first question about um, better in Scotland or better in, in Britain, um, or is the opportunity there? The opportunity is, of course, there to do something different 
in Scotland. But I think there's an important thing we need to address here for a second, which is um, what I've got to say is the rather assertion-heavy fact light suggestion that the UK has been good at distributing benefit and distributing risk. If it was really true that the UK benefit system had been effective at distributing the benefits of economic growth in Britain, why is it we are one of the most unequal countries by income in the world and damn near the most geographically unequal country? <laughs> The potential for Britain to distribute wealth is there, but it hasn't followed it. And this is all because of economic orthodoxy. All of the questions that you're asking are really about finance, not the services. What you're saying is, can we afford this? And I think it's time that we started to say that the real problem here is an economic problem. We have a low pay economy, which does not generate tax revenues, takes a lot of corporate profits out of our economy overseas, and this leaves our public finances as a problem. Poverty is not a social problem, and it can't be fixed socially. Poverty is an economic problem, and it has to be fixed economically. Alec Johnson. Without addressing many of the issues that have been addressed already, what I take from the discussion that we've had is, sadly, that governments that want to get elected tend to try to bribe the electorate by promising lots of free stuff, and what we have at the moment is a moment of economic reality in the United Kingdom when no party seems to think anybody will believe it if it just promises free stuff, except perhaps the SNP who take this jam tomorrow attitude with everything. Now, my worry is that we don't have an economy that can properly generate the resources necessary to maintain the welfare state. But we have a plan. In Scotland Le or in the we, UK? We, we have a plan. The Labour Party have an alternative plan, an alternative policy. But what we're hearing from the SNP is the assertion that it will be OK. But I'm not hearing anything that demonstrates that it will be OK. We're not getting facts. I'm looking forward to that white paper when it comes in a few weeks' time. And if there are no facts in it, then I think Jamie will be left with no defence for his position at all. But if you could just clarify, you, you said you were concerned about not having enough money to provide the sort of system you would like to see. Did you mean that in the event of independence or in terms of the UK as a whole? In terms of the UK policy, then it's necessary for us to uh, change the way that we run the country. And I believe that the current government in Westminster are dealing with that radically. We have a growing economy. We have an economy that's changing balance from public to so private sector. So your concern sector, is if we became and independent? I believe, I believe that we are achieving. Now, in a Scottish context, the argument that the SNP bring forward is that somehow in an independent Scotland that is not necessary, that we will simply have the money and it's not necessary to change policy. Is that what you're I saying, I don't believe Jamie that Hepburn? for a minute. I don't believe that is what I'm saying, Glenn, and let me reassure So there might have to be Alec. cuts in an independent Scotland I don't also. think that was the point I was making, Glenn, and if you let me make the point, I think, let me first of all reassure Alec, the white paper will be uh, entirely fact-based. It's just <laughs> a, a case of listening uh, to those uh, facts. I mean, I think the question was uh, posed about you know, how we grow the economy and create the jobs and I think that is uh, absolutely key in terms of uh, our approach to welfare as well because we want to get people off of welfare and in to work and in terms of the economic strategy that we see pursued at UK level which is disinvesting from uh, the economy yeah, I, know that the, economic I know that growth. the SNP accept that with independence you need to have a share of national debt and so on so Indeed. if you have to pay that down uh -huh. doesn't it follow that there may have to be further cuts in areas like welfare in the event of independence? Well, actually, let's look at the uh, latest figures that were presented in the Government Expenditure and Revenue Scotland, the GERS report, which demonstrate that 9.9% of UK taxation comes from Scotland, but only 9.3%. But you, you're not ruling out oh, right. further 9, savings on welfare. of UK expenditure. So actually, remaining in the UK increases our indebtedness. That's the point. OK, thank you very much indeed. We are getting into our final minutes. I want to move on and try and squeeze in another question and more of your contributions from the audience. Uh, Claire Duncan is our next contributor. Claire. Today, food banks are a lifesaver for many families on the poverty line. Does the panel think the prominence of food banks is a sign that the welfare system no longer helps those most in need? Is the prevalence of food banks a sign the system no longer helps those most in need? Robin McAlpine. 
It's a sign that the economy is wrong. Um, Alex said that we've just reached economic reality in the UK. Well, if that's reality, I don't know what surrealism looks like. We have an economy in the south of England which is being overheated again by inflating house prices to make it look like everything's OK, and it really isn't. We have a massively faltering economy. I can only say again that successive governments have pursued policies which favour low-pay employment because they create jobs fast. We need to change track altogether. We need to learn from people who've done this better. And there's a fundamental mistake which is being made here, which is, who has done this? Because it isn't countries who cut back their welfare state. It's categorically not countries who cut back their welfare state of the better economic performance. Almost all the countries which are above us in international competitiveness, on productivity, on uh, ending poverty, they have higher rates of tax. A welfare state is a very effective way of distributing money across the economy and it creates all kinds of jobs and income. OK, Eden. The problem is not all countries charge an employer 13.8% to hire somebody. If there's anything that can create youth unemployment, it's high taxation. Because we, uh, an employer cannot afford to take these people Sweden, on. And Sweden and Denmark and Norway have functionally abolished poverty and low tax USA has poverty and unemployment and, everywhere. And Facts, we not appear dogma. to be that sort of society okay. that has heterogeneous Can I just focus you back on food banks, which was yeah. the, the point of the, the question. How do you read the, the prominence or prevalence of, of food banks? What do you think that says about the effectiveness or otherwise of our current welfare system? I think the welfare system is failing. And it is failing these people who end up in food banks because there's not enough uh, payment to the people who need to keep feeding themselves. It's pretty obvious. Except, I think it lumps everybody into one thing. Lower income groups come in many types. There's people with chaotic lives. There's people who've got half a job, which Robin mentions. There's people with decent jobs that aren't being actually paid enough to keep going. We need to get the welfare system such that people have the incentive to pull themselves out of it. The dynamic is more important than the static fact of a low wage. But you think, you think, like Robin, a point that perhaps you agree on, people should be paid more for the work that they, they currently do? Uh, employers will pay as much as they can if they can, but we have to find a way of letting those wages rise. The way to do that is to cut taxes. Okay, is to get rid of the overhead of employing people. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, we'll hear from our politicians in a moment. Let's get some further contributions uh, from members of the audience. The gentleman on the, the front row here. I'm going to be controversial and say, surely the politicians need to be honest, and we are not getting honesty from politicians. What you need to be doing is saying, the population of the United Kingdom is this, in 1948, it was that. And you look at the figure of how long people lived then and what services were provided then. How long are they living now and what services are being provided now? What has changed? Whether it's heart operations, whether it's bypasses, there were loads of things that never happened. You've got to look at the big picture, and none of you are doing it. Okay. And none of you are being honest. OK, thank you very much. Well, they'll get their, their chance to be... Honest and frank with us in a, a moment. Yeah, gentleman with the open neck shirt, yeah. Everyone's been excellent at telling us what they wouldn't do. You know, we won't have the bedroom tax, we'll go backwards. Nobody's been very good at all at giving us solutions. We want to know what you would do. What you, you have the opportunity for some brave new ideas. What would you do differently? Not what you won't do. We want to know what you will do. OK, thank you very much. And gentleman in the, the row back one again. Yes, I wanted to pick up on the point that Robin made that the countries that are ahead of us socially and economically, do these tend to be small countries? Yes. yes. And what, what point do you draw from that? That small countries tend to, tend to look after their own affairs better, and the bigger the country is, the harder it is for them to do so. OK, thank you very much indeed. OK. Um, right, our politicians, we're looking for honest answers. Tell us what you will do, not what you won't do. Who wants to go first? Jackie Bailey. Can I pick up the point about food banks? Because I think we, we've just accepted that food banks are part of our high streets. And I actually think in the 21st century, it is frankly appalling that we have food banks in our country. I don't think it's just a failure of the welfare system. Um, the people I see at the food bank in my local area are people who are employed, who cannot make it to the end of the week without assistance. And that, frankly, is a tragedy. We do need to make work pay. I'm equally clear responding to the gentleman about what would you do positively. Our ambition is to get Britain back to work. 
We've said how we would do it. We would create a capital stimulus. We would make sure that there was a mansion tax in place. And we would tax, frankly, the bankers' bonuses, something the Tory coalition is not prepared to do. We need to create the income that allows that stimulus, okay. that allows us to get Britain back to work. Jamie Hepburn. I, I want to bring this back to food banks, Glenn, because I actually have, and with your acquiescence, I'll quote directly from a letter I have here from the Department for Work and Pensions to Glasgow City Council. This is what they think the reason we have food banks are. They say in their letter, the increased emphasis on reducing food waste may well be one of the drivers for the growth in the number of food banks and similar initiatives, and consequently, the increased use by families. So there we have, okay. folks. It's not the welfare reforms. It's because we're actually doing better in dealing with food waste. Why on earth are we allowing these people to decide here in Scotland our welfare state? It's time for us to take that back here to Scotland. Okay. I need to let Alec Johnson come in before we come to our close. The solution to the problem is to rebalance the economy, to get more people into work, to ensure that the wealth creating parts of the economy are larger and that the wealth consuming public sector is smaller. And it only takes a slight change in balance in order to achieve the objective of making the economy self-financing and grow jobs. The, one, the specific issue in food banks, uh, I would like to pay tribute to the people who are running food banks in Scotland. I know the reason that food banks are necessary are many-fold, but they include the fact that people with chaotic lifestyles in some cases, who are being supported in terms of finance through the welfare system, may choose to spend the money on things other than food. I also know that although food remains a relatively small part of a weekly budget, it is a growing part of a weekly budget okay. and it places demands on people. Uh, I pay tribute to what's happening, but I hope that we can get to a point soon where they will not be necessary. Okay, I'm going to go back very briefly for the last word to our questioner, to Claire Duncan. Your thoughts? Um, yeah, Alex said about getting more people back into work. It's not about that. It's much, much deeper than that. The vast majority of people in work are also on benefits. And also, Jackie mentioned about um, sharing sharing the um, the risk and the benefits. That's just not happening just now. Um, policies that are made in Westminster favour the South East of England. They don't do Scotland. Um, they're not in Scotland's best interest. We need that the choice to do better going forward. OK, thank you very much indeed to everybody in our audience and to all of those on our panel. Believe it or not, that's us at the end of our time for this uh, special edition of Newsnight. That's all from this programme. Raymond will be here tomorrow night with an interview with the First Minister on the day the Scottish Government announces its legislative programme for the year ahead. But from all of us here in Glasgow, have a very good night. night.